The second tool we're going to look at for this course for desktop virtualization is going to be, well, I'm sorry, workstation virtualization is going to be VMware. So VMware is a commercial product. It's available uh, to download from VMware's website, but if you want to use it, uh, you may have to pay for it if you get the, uh, the standard versions, but there is a version that's called the community version that you can use without paying for a license, though it doesn't have some of the features. So you could use either version for this course, for these, uh, for these labs in this unit and, next, and the next unit, um, but it's better if you use the commercial version just to see what all the options are and what's available and what might be a little bit different than the uh, uh, from VirtualBox. So we're going to just, I'm just going to walk you through in this presentation um, some of the features that you'll find in VMware Workstation, uh, how to configure and install your virtual machine, and then uh, again, just like uh, just some of the features that we learned about, sort of as we learned about with Oracle VirtualBox. So we'll kind of go through the same structure that we did with Oracle VirtualBox. So for installing VMware uh, Workstation, um, I'm geared towards this presentation towards version 12. There may be a newer version out by the time you're looking at this presentation, but I'm sure it won't be that much different. You do have to make sure you meet the minimum specifications. I'm sure most of the computers that, that most students would have would meet these basic specs, but it's good to just take a look at those just in case. But these are the minimum specs. Not much, right? Disk space, 1.2 gigs of usable disk space. That's really not that much by today's standards. 64-bit um, x86 Intel uh, processor equivalent, AMD Athlon, right? So you have to have certain types of processors. Um, this says that the minimum is 64-bit, but I believe there are versions of VMware that also support 32-bit. Uh, but you'll only be use a you'll only be able to use a 32-bit guest in that case. So to install uh, VMware Workstation 12, um, there's both a standard and silent installation method. So the standard method is a wizard, just like most applications that you install in Windows or Mac. It's a wizard. You click some buttons, next, 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 and then it gets installed. There's also a silent method, which is useful if you need to install uh, VMware on multiple computers. Uh, you can use the silent method. We're not going to cover the silent method of installation in this course, but uh, it's good to know that, that it's something that you could do, that it's an available option. So with the standard installation, uh, to prepare for the process, ensure that you meet the minimum specifications. I have the VMware Workstation 12 installation file uh, that you obtained earlier in the course. Uh, you'll find a reference to that. That chapter one that, that you see here, that's chapter one from the, uh, um, from the readings from week one. So in week one, there's a PDF. And in chapter one, they tell you where to go download VMware Workstation 12. Uh, if the path is changed, I'll certainly post something in Blackboard. You'll see a, a notification in Blackboard. Determine whether you want to use the typical or custom installation method. And like I said, we're not going to cover the silent method, uh, but I just want you to be aware that it exists, and you can certainly use that if you wanted to. So after you install VMware Workstation 12, um, you can immediately begin using it to create and configure your virtual machines, not unlike uh, VirtualBox. So it's very similar to VirtualBox, just a different UI, but a lot of the same features, a lot of the same concepts. Uh, if you did not enter a license during the installation, there will be a welcome window um, showing VMware Workstation 12 license options. After completing the license page, um, you'll have the uh, administrative console is going to be displayed. It's going to look something like this. It's a little cleaner, I think, than the VirtualBox. Um, you know, looks a little bit more modern than VirtualBox's UI. But for the most part, they have uh, the same basic structure. Down the left-hand side, you've got a list of virtual machines. Uh, when you click on a machine, you'll see on the right-hand side the tools for that virtual machine in the uh, main console. So in the administrative console, it can be used to create virtual machines. You can configure the settings on existing virtual machines. You can import virtual machines, uh, manage your existing virtual machines. It has a library pane and a summary console pane for each of the VMs. Um, which So the library pane is on the left side. Then you have your summary console on the right side. The library pane um, organizing was displayed in the tabs. Um, initially, you're, you're only going to have a home tab, um, which will have your uh, creating a VM, opening an existing VM, connecting to a remote host. So that'll be in the uh, home tab. But then once you create some machines, you'll see some additional tools there as well. So to create a virtual machine, uh, before we do that, we, uh, uh, we want to make sure we know what operating system the virtual machine is going to run. In our case, in the lab, we're going to use a Linux VM. Name and location of virtual machine files. You might want to decide ahead of time where you're going to store these files. There is a default location in VMware. The amount of memory that you're going to assign the virtual machine. Uh, which network connectivity option you're going to use, which we discussed already uh, twice in this course. The type of virtual disk adapter, whether it's SCSI or IDE. Uh, the, the disk type, fixed or dynamic, which again, we discussed that already a few times. Um, and the maximum disk size. 
So when you create it, you have two options. You can use a custom and typical. So a custom option is best because it gives you control of all the settings. Um, the uh, typical options uh, will, tr will automatically uh, uh, create some of the settings for you based on the operating system that you chose in your own environment. So you want to select the hardware comp compatibility option for the virtual machine. Select an installation method for the guest OS. Typically, this will be an ISO file. Um, you could also use a uh, CD-ROM drive or DVD drive on your computer that has the uh, installation files on it. Um, select the virtual machine name, a uh, storage location for the configuration and data files. Select the number of processors that you want to assign, the amount of memory to allocate to the virtual machine. You're going to indicate what type of network you're going to use. Um, whether you're going to change the uh, the storage driver, whether it's IDE or SCSI adapters. Um, oh, whoops, sorry, it's the same slide again. Here we go. That's what I was looking for. So this is a uh, image of the uh, some of the screens that you're going to see. Um, so here we see uh, uh, this option was selected to install the operating system later. But when you create the virtual machine, you could use a disk or an ISO file, which you could select above that. And it'll automatically start installing from the uh, from the disk. If you are installing Windows, you can put in the product key in this screen, so VMware will install Windows for you automatically, um, and it'll fill in these uh, fields. So these these are just you know some of the things you have to fill out when you're doing a Windows install. So this will sort of slipstream the uh, these settings into the install for Windows, so it makes it a little bit easier. And this is where we select the networking options. And again, this is very much like Oracle VirtualBox. It's the same vernacular, right? So we, we have bridged or NAT. So you choose bridged or NAT, um, just like we did in VirtualBox. So some custom options. You can select what disk type you want to use, the maximum disk size, um, whether it's going to be dynamic or a fixed size. You can review the selection or the settings, what, you know, what driver, we talked about that already, whether it's IDE or SCSI or SATA, uh, and so forth. So there's the size, uh, how we store it. You can see that in uh, VMware, uh, you can split the virtual disk into multiple files, which makes it uh, easier to move the virtual machine to another computer. You might ask yourself why. It's because uh, if you have one single file that's 60 gigabytes, sometimes it's very difficult to move that to another computer because it's hard to move a huge file over the network like that um, for a variety of reasons. And sometimes you, you can't even copy it to a USB drive. Sometimes they don't support file sizes over a certain size. A lot of the, uh, you know, when you buy a USB drive, they're usually FAT32 by default. You would have to format it as NTFS in order to copy these huge files to it. So it's just an extra step. But if you make these files small, then you can copy them a little bit easier. All right, so um, as far as uh, creating a virtual machine, um, you can use the new easy install feature, which automates the uh, installation of Windows and Linux operating systems when you're creating the virtual machine. So it'll complete the guest installation by installing VMware tools. So it'll slipstream those tools right into the installation. You don't have to do it after the fact. If you remember with VirtualBox, when you ran the install, you had to go and add the, uh, the add-on tools later on. If you use the, this method, it's going to do it for you automatically. Uh, it's certainly a, a lot faster to use the easy install option with VMware. It's a nice feature. So once you're running VMware, you'll have the uh, some of the other tools in the console. One of the first things you might want to do is add a virtual machine to the console. Um, so you can certainly do that with, uh, with VMware, just like we can in Oracle VirtualBox. So you might want to add an existing machine uh, to administrative cost because you're running a virtual appliance that you downloaded, just like VirtualBox. Uh, you're moving a virtual machine to another computer or distributing a virtual machine to multiple hosts. So to move the virtual machine, it's not unlike uh, Oracle VirtualBox. You're going to copy the machine files to the new host, and you can simply uh, import them uh, to the new host. You can just point to those directories, uh, to the folder, rather, uh, that has the files in it, and it will import them. Um, you can add the machine to uh, the, from the administrative console. One thing you have to uh, look at for VMware, one thing that's kind of important with VMware is you have this universal unique identifier or a UUID code that's assigned to each virtual machine. So when you copy a VM from one machine to another, um, uh, you have to indicate whether or not you want to assign it a new UUID or you're using the existing UUID. Uh, so you have to take a look at that when you're moving it. So it and you'll be asked when you try to import the new virtual machine 
I think when you try to import it, it's going to say something like, uh, are you copying or moving this virtual machine? And the reason it asks you that is it's asking you how to um, how to deal with the uh, UUID, which also affects the MAC address. And as we discussed with VirtualBox, the, you can't have two virtual machines on the same network that have the same MAC address that would cause some issues. So it's important to be aware of that. All right, so in the library pane, which is on the left-hand side, it's going to show your groups of VMs and folders so you can control and manage multiple VMs as a group. So it lets you organize your VMs. Um, so it almost looks like a, uh, you know, like the file structure in Windows, more or less, or any file structure really on any operating system. Um, so you can also, and this is a nice feature in VMware, which you can't do with VirtualBox, uh, you can connect to a remote host with the console. So with the console, uh, you can have VMware running on a different computer and connect your console to a different uh, computer's VMware to control it, um, which is kind of, you know, sort of looks like what we do in the data center, which we'll talk about later with vSphere. Um, so it kind of has a feature that, uh, that that kind of emulates what you can do with something like vSphere in the data center. So you could use VMware Workstation on a uh, small scale for, you know, like a small IT department, I suppose, with uh, you know, running a a few a few servers in a data center or something like that. Um, so the menu toolbar uh, contains all your menu options for VMware Workstation. You can go through that, of course, after you install it. Uh, the button to the right of the menu options are shortcuts that allow you to quickly perform certain operations, like the power button, the interrupt button, the clock buttons to manage a uh, to, which helps you manage a snapshot, the screen button, which you can use to uh, to look at the console or to look at the screen in, uh, um, in, in the, the workstation or the, the desktop rather that you're, uh, that you're running virtually. There's a console button. Under the file menu, you can create new virtual machines, open up a new window, open and close tabs, connect to a remote server, uh, connect to VMware vCloud, uh, virtualize a physical machine, um, so convert a physical machine to a VM. You can export to OVF format, and if you recall, the OVF format is uh, is the open VM format, so it should work with other VM platforms, or even in the cloud, you could take a VMware uh, image of a VMware system, convert it to OVF, and you should be able to upload it to Azure or Google Cloud or Amazon and, uh, and run it in their cloud, uh, map virtual disks, uh, or exit the application. And I should mention with VMware Workstation, when you exit the console, it does not close your virtual machine. That's a common misconception that some students have. They think when they close that console that it's going to shut down their virtual machine, which which it doesn't do that. So uh, it's important to be aware of that. You actually have to shut down your virtual machine uh, and close VMware Workstation. Uh, or you can leave your machine running in the background if you want. All right, so in the edit menu, it's uh, you know there's a whole bunch of features in the edit menu. I don't want to go through all of these individually, but uh, but certainly you could take a look at those as well once you install VMware Workstation and uh, you can play around with some of these options. And in the view menu, again, you've got some options in the view menu. I don't want to uh, waste your time going through all these. I think you could take a look at these and see which ones you think are useful. Um, and the VM menu has options for managing and configuring the VM. Um, again, I, I don't want to go through all of these. I should probably mention the send control at the lead is important. I don't think I talked about that with VirtualBox, but if you try to hit Control Alt Delete um, to have it go to your remote machine, it's going to get the way because Control Alt Delete is um, is an important sequence of of keys. That's it's it's going to affect all of their virtual machines in addition to the host machine. So um, if you want to send a Control Alt Delete to a specific VM, you want to use the menu option to do that rather than hitting Control Alt Delete on your keyboard which would uh, cause a control alt delete on the, uh, on, the, on the host as well as the guest. All right, so uh, the settings option uh, for the VM menu, there's a hardware tab that has a list of virtual device options for configuring memory, hard drive, CD, DVD, you know, all of the peripheral devices. So you have a, a toolbar option to configure how that's handled with VMware Workstation. Uh, by the way, you can't edit a lot of these settings unless the workstation is powered off with workstation. So with VMware Workstation, you can't change, say, the memory usage or the number of processors, the hard disk space. All those things have to be managed when the machine is turned off. Um, and that's not necessarily true with some of the enterprise products, but with workstation, you do have to turn the machine off. But that's one of the features that you get with some of the enterprise products. And of course, there's a help menu, which I don't want to 
waste too much of your time here talking about the help menu. I think we've all used those before. Um, all right, so starting and stopping your VMs. So in the VM uh, menu, you can start up your guest. You can power it on uh, or power on the firmware. You can power on a whole bunch at the same time if you want to. To shut down a guest, just like um, with VirtualBox, you can use the OS's shutdown procedure first. Um, but if that doesn't work, there are other ways to shut down. You can send the, uh, the command to shut down from VMware, uh, just as if you push the power button on the VM. You could also just simply shut it off, just like you would a real computer. Uh, but sometimes you can lose data if you do that. So when you go to shut off a VM using the, uh, the console in uh, VMware, this is the dialog that will come up. You can either suspend, you can power it off, you can run it in the background or cancel. If you run in the background, it will not power off the machine. It simply runs it in the back. It's still running, but you just don't have a window to that machine. You have to use the console to open up the window again to, uh, to view the machine and start working with it again. So for configuring memory and CPU, when the machine is powered off, you can set the amount of RAM that it uses. You can... Uh, um, you can change the amount of RAM, so um, so you can, you know, let's say you want more RAM or you want less RAM, you can do that. Like I said, in some of the enterprise products, you can do this without shutting the machine down. By default, the VM is configured to attach uh, the virtual CD DVD ROM to the secondary IDE controller. But if you have multiple CD ROM drives, VMware detects them. Um, so if you double click on a CD DVD in the devices pane of the VM's tab, specify the device you want your VM to access, and then you'll be able to access it. So when you're in VMware, on depending on what version, either the bottom right or the upper right, you'll see an icon for all of your different optical drives. And you can double, like, so let's say you put a CD in and you want to be able to access it from your virtual machine, you just double click on that CD-ROM drive and then it will pass it through to the virtual machine. You can access it in Windows Explorer just like you would a normal CD or DVD drive. So the VMware tools, uh, these are very similar to the ones that, uh, the, the additional tools that we added in VirtualBox. It's the same idea. It gives you better control, better video, and all that stuff. Um, you know, it, it handles the keyboard and the mouse a little bit more elegantly. Um, and just like VirtualBox, it's available for both Windows and Linux. Um, not sure about Mac. I imagine it probably is, though. There's probably a package for Mac that you can install. Um, as I said before, if you use the easy install method, it'll actually automatically install the VMware tools for you uh, if you use the easy install. If not, you can install the tools later on, just like we did with VirtualBox. It's the same, same process. You can create new virtual disks, which we've talked about before, what these virtual disks are. So you can create additional virtual disks uh, for the VM. I'm sure there's a limit. I don't recall what it is. Uh, I think it might be 30 uh, disks is the limit. Uh, as far as networks go, just like in VirtualBox, you can use Bridged um, for your uh, for your network interface, or you can use Host Only Switch, which isolates the VM from the physical network, but it can still communicate with the host computer. So if you're doing some research or if you're doing um, some testing or something like that, you can isolate your VM to just your host, so it can't connect to the network. And of course, we talked about NATing already as well. Um, but that is also an option, so you can use NAT. And these are the same options that are available in uh, in VirtualBox. So it's just it's presented a little bit differently. They work a little bit differently, but it's essentially the same options. They kind of do the same thing. Uh, so they uh, a lot of the stuff that we're talking about does work in uh, in VirtualBox. You could take a snapshot. So VirtualBox supported this as well. Do the same thing in VMware Workstation. We could take a snapshot of our VM and use it later. Um, so if you use the, uh, to, to take a snapshot, you're going to use the console to do that. There's a menu option where you can go in and take a snapshot and you can view all of your existing snapshots of a VM. And like I said before, if you're doing some testing or if you're you know doing some research or something like that, you could take a snapshot before you make any changes. So you can always go back to a version of the uh, of the virtual machine before you made some changes, and there we can see some snapshots on a nice timeline, so we know, you know, when each of those uh, snapshots was taken. I should mention that snapshots do use a lot of disk space, so um, I know some people go a little crazy making snapshots and then wonder why it's filling up their drive. Uh, so it is important to be aware that when you do those snapshots, it's going to take up a lot of space. So you can't just take snapshots all the time. Uh, you have to be kind of strategic about when you take your snapshots and where you store them. 
If you want to transfer files between the virtual machine and the host computer, there's a couple ways to do that. If you have the VMware tools installed, you can do drag and drop between the host and the guest. Um, whether you install the tools or not, you can use shared folders, but you do have to have the network configured to do that. Uh, so either host only mode, NAT, or bridged, any one of those, but you can't, um, you can't have the networking turned off for shared folders to work. Uh, and you can map virtual disks. And just like with um, uh, VirtualBox, you can also do cloning with VMware. Um, so you can have a, a parent virtual machine, which is a complete, uh, and make a copy of it. So you can use the parent as your, as your master for the cloning. Um, you could do a linked clone, which uh, which I don't think you could do with VirtualBox, uh, but I think we talked about linked clones a little bit in the uh, in the first PowerPoint. Um, but basically, a linked clone is when you can have multiple virtual machines running from a linked clone. So it uses fewer resources. It's when you have lots of different workstations that are going to be using the same VM uh, or the same image, uh, and they can share a lot of those components uh, rather than having each one having their own separate and distinct virtual machine. And just like in VirtualBox, you may have to configure the uh, the ports for uh, for VMware for your VMware workstation, uh, and it's very similar. You can turn off automatic detection of uh, USB device. Um, in VirtualBox, it does give you an option. I'm sorry, in in VMware, it does give you an option at the bottom. Uh, you can click to attach devices that are attached to the host um, uh, peripherals or host ports. So you can add those ports sort of dynamically in, uh, in VMware as things are connected. To access a VM from multiple VM Workstation 12 Pro hosts, you can uh, place the VM files in a shared network drive, or you can share them from the parent host computer. Uh, and then anybody who's on a different uh, computer can connect their VMware uh, console, um, you know, the admin tools, to a different VMware workstation and manage machines on a completely different computer. One thing I want to make clear here, though, is that um, using this method, you can manage a virtual machine even if it doesn't have network access. So if you create a virtual machine that doesn't have any networking at all and no access to the network, you can still manage it from the VM console and you can still set it up so that you can use a VM console on a different computer to connect to that VM over the network, but the VM itself will not have access to the network. So that is possible. You can, with VMware, convert your physical computer to a VMware uh, to a virtual machine. Uh, so VMware has a converter that can do that for you in Workstation. So you can install it on a computer. It'll basically snapshot that computer into a virtual machine. Uh, and that's another great tool if you're trying to, you know, we'll talk about this later on, but if you're trying to migrate a physical environment to a virtual environment, this is a great tool to do that. And also if you want to go to the cloud, because most of the cloud providers also support importing virtual machines. So you could use the VMware converter to convert a physical server to a virtual and then upload it to the cloud uh, to start using that machine from the cloud. So that's a VMware workstation. So in this unit, you're going to have two labs. One lab is going to be setting up a Windows machine in VirtualBox, and the other lab is creating a Linux virtual machine using um, um, VMware workstation. And if you have any questions, let me know. Thank you.